from the great halls of their house, there are assembled three who hope to one day be the world's greatest driving heroes. Created from the cosmic legends of the universe comes our team captain, the Vision, Bill Fisher. Their soon-to-be Wonder Woman, Vicki Fisher. Our Captain Marvel and head flight trainee, Jennifer Scripchuk. And our Batman, the master of tools, gadgets, and all things mechanical, our mild-mannered soon-to-be billionaire, Alan Danvers. Their mission, to fight injustice, share what is right and wrong, to get you out of your house and come out racing with them, and serve all mankind. They are the Garage Heroes in Training Team. Welcome to the Garage Heroes in Training Podcast. I'm going to be your host for this episode, and my name is Bill. Who's hosting? I'm Vicki. I'm Jennifer. We have a guest. We have a returning guest, a returning guest with some great news about some new products. And we're going to suck up to him a bit about how uh, his product has already performed on Gen 1 and maybe Gen 2 will be even better. We have with us race driver, racing coach, Apex Pro founder. I think that's about it. We have with us Andrew Rains. Welcome to the podcast, Andrew. (laughs) Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. I I really appreciate it. I probably should add more stuff to my title because it's not long enough. I can do that. I feel like an English aristocrat, you know. That's that's all right. Lord Vaughn. Yes, we have Lord Andrew Rains about to talk with us about what I believe is the Apex Pro. Is that right, sir? (laughs) That's the plan. Thanks for having me. No worries. Welcome aboard. Uh, For those of you who missed our earlier episode, who may not be familiar with you, Andrew, uh, could you kind of give a brief introduction just in case they missed it and they should have turned in earlier? It was a great episode. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Hi, my name's uh, Andrew Andrew Raines. Uh, I helped found Apex Pro and currently run the business operations uh, and marketing and sales for Apex Pro and uh, spend most of my time helping people learn from their Apex Pro data. So I'm in this really cool role where um, I get to start this business and create this product, and now I get to see how it helps people learn how to be better drivers and and kind of evolve the product to help people as well. Um, and then I I coach drivers as well, mostly Apex Pro customers. Um, mm-hmm. So I I'm very deeply involved in the motorsports world and uh, and loving it. So you have nobody to blame for this but yourself. It's pretty much all my fault. Um, yep. My dad maybe shares a little bit of the blame, but uh, that's. Uh, Neither here nor there. Can't blame your dad. Dad, Dads don't get blames. (laughs) So uh, if anybody wants to tune in again, the last episode where Andrew was on was number 159. So that wasn't too long ago. That was just after the beginning of the year. So not too long. Yeah. Yeah, So I've I've seen you uh, making the rounds. I mean, you last time I saw you, you were at Grid Life. How did Grid Life go for you? Uh, grid life is a blast. It, it's always a blast. Uh, they do so many things that are different and new and fresh and um, love being a part of it. So we ran GLTC. We have a, um, you're probably familiar with WRL world yeah. racing league. Yep. We have a WRL GP one car that I own with some other folks, probably similar to how you manage your endurance cars. You know, we have four owners in our car. Oh, cool. um, so it's, it's primarily focused on that series. So when we take it to grid life, it's not really built for the GLTC class, which is extremely competitive and has a lot of really fast guys that are putting together really, really good cars. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's still competitive enough that we can show up and have some fun. So uh, we enjoyed it. We finished 12th overall on the weekend out of about 40 cars um, and then finished as high as ninth, I think in one race. So we were competitive. We weren't in the top five, like I was hoping, but um, that's okay. Well, uh, we, we did see a post for a future podcast guest that somebody used their chrome horn, even though it's made of fiberglass, they used their chrome horn on you to uh, ask you to please move along, Mr. Eric Cattiel. <laughs> I did. I got, I got chrome horned a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> Eric and I, I, I got around Eric. Uh, he had an issue in race two. I got around him at the beginning and uh, he had a lot more pace than I did. Yeah. His and car's I, a beast. Yeah. He's, he's done a really good job with that car. It's really impressive. And he wheels, wheels the absolute crap out of it. So yeah, good for him. He gets going and uh, you know, he had some bad, bad luck, bad mechanical issues at a, I think it was at a test day and he's been uh, scrambling. So uh, we delayed our podcast because in spite of what I think our podcast is second in line behind him prepping his car. So 
uh, we give we give him a uh, get out of jail free card, and hopefully he'll have time soon to come on. So that'll be fun. Cool. Any uh, any grid life aha moments? I mean, you're fairly seasoned as far as racing goes. Anything that you got out of there saying, you know, that that was good, or I need to do um, that. Yeah, well, it was at NCM. Have, have y'all been in NCM? Yeah, before? I have. Vicky and Jen haven't yet. Okay, uh, crazy long, very. Um, technically challenging track yep, and kind narrow. of a unique, yeah, narrow. narrow, kind of hard sight lines, lots of guardrails, mm-hmm. um, not a whole lot to go off of visually. Um, and I'd never driven it before. Mm-hmm. And I knew I was showing up with probably the best, some of the best grassroots racers in the country. Um, and I knew I was going to struggle for pace, um, even having the experience that I do just from talking to people about the track. It's like, it's a very easy track to leave it, lose a 10th a corner and be 2.3 seconds off. Yeah, because right, it's 23 turns. So I remember my um, first lap. I'm going around. I'm like, all right, that wasn't so bad. And then I look at the uh, the number on the uh, flagger station, and I'm like, I'm only halfway done. Okay, we're still going. So yeah, yeah, big, big boy track. Yeah, it's it's a serious track, and I, I did a lot of preparation. And I felt good going into it, but I was a, a little disappointed in myself, mostly because I I, I set um, expectations for myself to to pick up the track and and not necessarily pick it up i felt comfortable after a few laps but mm-hmm. get the most everything lapping. out of the car what's that were you fast lapping i was trying, trying my best <laughs> <laughs> but I, I kind of expected to like get everything out of the car right away and that's just not realistic at a at a track that's that high risk and that's that um challenging and has that much nuance um so i i only probably got 98 percent out of the car which for me is very frustrating. So I have to get back there and, and um, I actually had Tom O'Gorman drive my car on Friday. Oh, wow. And, uh, he went quite a bit faster than I did. And it's been a very long time since I've had that dynamic in a car where I've had somebody in the exact same car as me go quicker. Um, just the nature of the work that I do, I'm usually coaching somebody mm-hmm. who hires me to help them go faster. So by default, I end up being more experienced to know the track better, all these things. Well, I've never been to NCM before. Tom's been there a million times. He's driven everything. He's driven at the pro level a lot longer than I had. And um, so I learned a lot just from um, his uh, approach, his style, some mm-hmm. of the insights that he brought just from being a different perspective. Um, so that was really cool. That was really eye-opening in a lot of ways, just, just remembering um, when I go to race, I'm always trying to figure out ways to – um, relate the learning process to drivers that I work with. So having that dynamic was, I think a really good thing was like, Oh, Tom came in and, and ripped my time apart. Right. And went and set a much faster lap. And now I've got to kind of reorganize my thoughts and figure out how to, how to go as quickly as he did. Um, do you think that do. was, do you think that was track knowledge or do you think it was, um, what do you think led to the the differences or haven't you got to digest the data yet? Um, I've looked at I've looked at the data pretty significant um, for a pretty good amount of time, and there's definitely more so than I think other tracks. I think there is track knowledge. Mm. Um, I think a solid amount of that is is particularly just um, using certain parts of the track that that I didn't know that you could, or, or pushing track limits boundaries in some mm-hmm. areas. Um, and then the other parts were just um, one corner where he really beat me was the slowest corner on the track. Right. Uh, and he's got a lot of autocross experience. There's just a lot of things that came in that I on my fastest lap, I really underdrove that corner. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if you look at our data in the fast corners, we're almost identical. I mean, I'm I'm actually a decent bit quicker than he was in turn five, which is the fastest corner on the track. So it really taught me something about myself that I'm very confident in um, corners where I necessitate like really long sight lines, vision way ahead of the car, very smooth inputs, but where you have to toss the car more aggressively and pop off Mm -hmm. the brakes. He was really, um, just showing that he had that skill that I, that I, that muscle that I hadn't flexed. So yeah, it was a combination of track knowledge, but also the slow speed corners. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's what I've got to work on. Yeah. I, I, well, you know what I would do? See, Vicki and I went to mid Ohio last weekend. And one of the things that I found stumbled upon is this great track discussion video that you put out with the, I believe he's an E30 record holder. I forgot his name. I just blanked yeah. on it. Anthony Magnanoli. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, you know, that helped me a ton. I watched, I actually digested it in two viewings because I think it's a, it's over an hour for sure. And uh, that was, that was a lot of fun, especially uh, Vicky got to look at it a little bit. That was her first time at mid Ohio. So she got to experience both dry and wet. So that was, that was exciting. Ooh, cool. 
And you're still here to tell the tale. <laughs> yeah, with the same car. So that's a good thing. <laughs> I was terrified. <laughs> that's a scary track when it's wet. Yeah. <laughs> if you can drive that track when it's wet, you're, you're good to go anywhere. It just reminded me of jumping lava. Like when you were little, don't touch the floor. And that's what all those slick spots were on the track. It's like, don't touch the slick spots. And you just had to keep, you know, zigzagging around the, the track to avoid that. It's crazy. By far the slickest track Vicky's ever done, even counting yeah. her skid pad days. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it so. is pretty scary. Is, is there a video? Oh, yeah. We got lots of video. <laughs> We got lots of yeah. video, and I fairly figured out how to put our speed on it. So we're going to be using single digits on some of the turns. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> terrible. I'm in training. <laughs> yep, absolutely. All right. Why that's we why roll? we're here. So, because he has a. You need to talk up that either your so microphone. A... There you go. Your microphone might not be on. Yeah. Okay. Um, he's he's on a schedule, so why don't we uh, go ahead and start? We already started. Okay, doke. We are we are <laughs> we are at the we are here, Vicky or Jen, do good, bad, and the ugly about the race weekend. Oh geez. Yeah, so what is the good, bad, ugly about the race weekend? That's about my my race weekend? Your mm-hmm. GLTC weekend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the, the that's a that's a really good way to look at it. So the good was uh we came home in one piece. Everything was fine. Always good. Um, yeah, nothing got damaged. Um which is great. I did have some car to car contact on several occasions, not because of um, mostly just like a Miata spun in front of me. It's actually a great video. I'll send it to you in an email, send you the clip, but that'd be great. We'll um, put it on the pod. Yeah. Rear tires locked up mid corner and he went around and I clipped him with the left front, hit his uh, left rear and had to uh, turn our car into a pirate car. Cause it smashed the, the headlight. So we taped it up uh-huh. with black tape and it looked like the car had an eye patch. Okay. Very um, nice. Yeah, so that was uh, that was the good. Everything um, came away. The, the bad was that I was I I was disappointed with the expectations that I set for myself, um, and I think that was a little frustrating because the last GLTC event I did was at NOLA, which is a much flatter, simpler track. First time there, but I got everything out of the car in qualifying. I did three laps within a hundredth of a second, and I just knew I, I had that intuition when I got out of the car that there just wasn't anything left for it to give. Um, without putting it off the track in a big way. Um, and so I didn't quite have that feeling at NCM. So I had kind of um, improperly set expectations from such a great driving performance. I felt like my first weekend with GLTC, and this time I felt like I kind of underdrove the car. And um, certainly by other people's standards, I don't think that's the case. I had a lot of feedback from folks who are still very impressed with our ability to put the car where it is for the prep level that it is. But um, particularly after working with Tom, after looking at all my data and just putting everything together, I'm like, man, there's, it's not an enormous gap, but there's, uh, it's just me not being happy with the way that I drove. And that's, that's kind of hard to, fr- it, it doesn't happen often for me and it's very hard to deal with. So I think it's a big learning moment. Um, Welcome to being in training with us. Exactly. Oh, I mean, there's, there's nothing like reminding yourself, like, you know, it was the slow speed corners. It's like, Hey, you're just not quite hustling the slow speed corners. You're a little late to throttle. You're a little slow on the entry, you know, and mm-hmm. that's, uh, that's hard to, that's hard to realize. I get so comfortable with, with some of the places that I drive as much that, um, I expose that about mm-hmm. my, my own game, but luckily that's an easier thing to work on than, um, some of the other elements. So that's what, that's what I need to get focused on. There really wasn't any ugly. I'll, I'll, I will i i do not think it was, I did sing some, some karaoke in the paddock Saturday night. So for some, oh boy, that, that is ugly. ugly. <laughs> well, it's grid life. What, what happens at grid life stays at grid life. Hopefully. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. We can't talk about it too much. Otherwise <laughs> might incriminate somebody, but no, it was yeah, fun. Yeah. So did, what did you particularly learn from this particular race weekend? What was, what was your, your big thing that you felt that you're going to have to still work with? Uh, I need to take my own advice um, more in that I uh, need to be more disciplined during um, during the event to like sit down between sessions and have more isolated time to reflect on the session. So a lot I'm really as an extrovert, I'm kind of guilty of talking to people right after I get out of the car Mm -hmm. instead of reflecting by myself. Um, And I think had I done that, that kind of goes into what I really learned. That's, that's like one element of what I really learned is that on Friday at a new track, there was eight available test sessions 
And I ran all eight of them and not thinking I'm at a new track. The car is running. We're on slicks for the first time on this car, a little bit higher G loads. It's a pretty fast car. Uh, and it's a very challenging track. I physically and mentally wore myself out Friday to the point where mm -hmm. my fourth session, I really was just pounding sand, you know, mm -hmm. for lack of better terminology, right? Like I'm beating against an immovable object. I'm not going any faster. Um, you know, we went the wrong way with a setup change on the car. It got worse and uh, I should have done half as many sessions. So what I really learned is don't force it. If it's not, if it's not coming, if lap time's not coming, if you're the way you feel behind the wheel is not coming, don't keep beating against the wall. So do you think maybe reflecting in between races would have helped? Like you said, like taking those 10 minutes just to kind of go sit in your race truck or sit in your paddock area quietly and just kind of go through things in your head. I, I think so. I think that would have pointed me in that direction. I think I would have gone to the guys and said, you know what, I think we're going to do every other session for the rest of the day. We're going to take more time to debrief. We're going to try to make more meaningful changes with the car. Um, we put a new rear sway bar on the car, which is going to inherently make the car bias a little more towards oversteer. And it was mm -hmm. kind of an oversteery car at first with where we started on the sway bar. And, and that made it, you don't really want the car to oversteer on a track you don't know yet. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, that kind of hurt my confidence. Especially with all the Armco that's at uh, NCM. So there's a lot of it. Hey, I, I got an idea. If you, if you raced maybe four or six sessions somewhere like that, you know what you could do in between? You could review your Apex Pro data. Hmm. I don't know where you come up with these ideas. I just, yeah. it's just, a, just a thought. <laughs> I mean, you know. So rumor has it, a little birdie says that there may be new Apex Pro stuff. Could be software, <gasps> could be hardware. Is the birdie true? Have I been led astray? Is the birdie telling me what's factual? <laughs> it's the worst kept secret in motorsports at the moment, ah! I think. <laughs> Apex um, Pro is awesome. We appreciate it. But it, that, Bill, you're on the right, you're on the right scent. Uh, whoever, uh, whatever type of bird you listen to was, uh, was on it. Um, yeah, we've been, I, I don't think, you know, at, at, at any point, like if you're, if you're Apple or your GoPro, you're always working on the next product, right? So mm -hmm. we're, we're no different we just might move a little slower because we're a much smaller company and, and less capitalized, but yeah, we've been designing a new hardware device and some pretty significant software updates in the apex pro app kind of sphere that are going to coincide with this release of new hardware. So it's, it's very exciting. Um, lots of cool stuff happening. It's a secret. It's not a secret. I've already ordered one. Actually. Oh, two. have you? Actually two. Don't tell anybody. Yeah. Shh. So Andrew, Hardware? Any new hardware? Do we have like a Gen 2 coming? We do. Mm -hmm. I uh, I just realized I don't have it on my desk with me. Otherwise, I would show it to you physically. Um, it's probably same, same in, form factor or similar? Yes, very similar. Uh, okay. It's a little smaller, uh, actually. Oh. Uh, it's going to package even nicer on the dashboard. But the big thing is that all of the important stuff, the battery, the, uh, the GPS, the accelerometer, the IMU that we use, uh, the processor on the circuit board, all of the uh, all the good bits inside the device are all new, um, which is very important because in the electronics world, things things evolve very quickly. You know, you have new chips that come out, new technologies, and so we've kind of waited until those technology improvements are meaningful to the point where people can accept that they're buying something and getting something that has better equipment in it. Whereas even a year ago, there were some improvements, but we didn't really feel like it was to that point where the in, the in customer, you know, you on the track are going to actually see some of these differences because of the hardware, but now very confident that's, um, it's going to be a big change and it's going to be really, it's going to be really cool. Uh, and, and if you have the first one, you're, you're going to want to upgrade to this one because it's like taking everything that you love about the original apex pro and making it better, more reliable, simpler, and, uh, and just easier to use in general. So, um, so we've got a little bit of new hardware. We've got a little bit of new software, I believe. Is that true? That is true. Um, so to kind of coincide with the launch, we've also revamped the app. Um, so if you're familiar with the Apex Pro iOS app, um, Absolutely. you'll know that when, when you open it, there's like nine icons on the homepage. Mm -hmm. right? A bunch of different options. Well, no one, I guess maybe people told me, but 
being in like a developmental role where you're working with user interfaces and user experiences, you don't really think about, you know, it's a very elegant homepage. It works. But if you give people nine options, it's not obvious which things you're supposed to select or where you're supposed to go from that page. Right. So we've done a lot more research and like focus groups with people in our office and outside of it to kind of determine that you really want three icons on a page to choose from. Um, so we're trying to limit the scope of each page to where it's easier for somebody who's never used the app before to get to the right place. And it's even more simple for somebody who uses the app all the time to get where they want to go. So I think we've accomplished that. It's going to be, it's obviously always trial and error with an app, but I uh, can't wait until mid-May when people get to experience this new user interface. Awesome. Can't wait. So um, are there any chances to crew view? Changes. Yeah, there are. Oh, oh what, what, yeah. What, what are the changes to crew view? So there's lots of changes to crew view. Uh, and that's really our, our point of emphasis because that's something that Apex Pro can kind of uniquely leverage is the fact that we are using our phone uh, as an element in the system. So your phone is uh, kind of absorbing all this information from the device. And now we can do something with it because we have cellular connections or Wi-Fi connections. So CrewView has kind of turned into what a lot of our customers, I think, have envisioned from the beginning. But what you'll see now in CrewView is a public profile. So you'll actually get to create like a little avatar, you know, uh, use whatever picture you want to represent yourself. You'll get to go in and create a garage where you select the cars that you have. So you can assign those cars with the data. Um, and it's really cool. It's, you know, there's options, there's manufacturers of cars and all the models for that year. Um, and it's, that's a lot of fun to play with. And now people can go in and see your profile, what cars you drive. Um, oh, I and love then that. it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And they'll also see, um, your data that you submit that becomes a record. So if Vicki, you go to mid Ohio and you submit uh, a data session and you make it on the leaderboard, all of a sudden that's going to pop up on crew view in the app and say, Vicki just submitted her data for mid Ohio. And now I can go in and I can click it and I can actually see the data. I can see the car you were driving, the tire that you were on. Um, and if it's wet, now the app actually is taking real time weather information and saving it with each data session. Hmm. So we can actually create like a wet session leaderboard as well. That's okay. cool. Which would be really cool. Say, I was going to say her Sunday late session could be the leaderboard oh. on the wrong side. Yeah, it was bad. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Moving on. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> so, so being part of a, a multi-car, multi-driver team and having lost my phone many, many times as it's in the car the entire day, um, on the crew view setting, is there any uh, chance that the new update or maybe, you know, begging for a future update, we could get more data if we're within the team as opposed more, to more data coming from the device? Yeah, coming through. Because uh, right now you can see car position uh, on the track. You can see car line. You can see uh, speed, but you can't really see prior lap performance or prior sector performance or anything like that, that you can, once you get the camera, I mean, sorry, at the camera, once you get your phone in your hand, you get more data from the, the in-car phone. But is there any chance there could be an internal and an external level of detail? There's a pretty good chance. A pretty good chance. So, so you're saying there's a you're chance. You're saying a guy like you and a girl like me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great quote. Great movie. Uh, yes. So the um, the update to crew view is going to include uh, telemetry streaming. Nice. Now you're making me happy again. Oh, and that's really. I nice. forgot. You just you just reminded me. You know what I found the new like I like the Apex Pro. We we know that we have. Two, we have two on order. We have all the gadgets on the side. There was something new that I found this weekend. So I'm at Mid Ohio with Vicky, and it is dry, then it's dry, then it's transitioning to wet. And then the last session, it is wet, wet. Oh my God, we're on ice wet at Mid Ohio, which is famous for being slippery. So I'm going around, and all of a sudden, I start taking a peek out of my eye, and I start seeing how many green dots I have available to me. And it's accommodating the lack of grip that Mid-Ohio has at that particular point in time. So I could tell lap by lap 
if there's only three dots available, if I got all three or if I only got two or if I only got one. And it was Jacob. amazing how it, uh, Jen, you're not on mute. Jen, you're not muted. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> but it was amazing how it was able to quantify the grip available to me. Um, even during the transition from mid Ohio grippy to mid Ohio, totally not grippy and really quickly. That's awesome. I've, I've had that experience as well. And I, I call that use case our like believer experience because the people that question the um, capability of the real time grip display, if you experience it in changing conditions and you can witness what some of the, what the lights are displaying or you watch your video afterwards, mm -hmm. you realize that it's taking in more information than, than you really can. It's paying attention to stuff that you can't really pay attention to as a driver. And it's giving you one extra indication that there might be more grip than you think, or there might be less grip than you think. Yeah, that was the big uh, one. It, it did both because there was one turn where it kept going down and there was one turn where it didn't move and there was more grip for me to go get. And uh, I tested it the next time. Uh, sorry, I tested it. I tested it the next time and it was there. And then I tested it the next time and I apparently tested too much, but it was, you know, it was knowing I was pushing a limit because I knew there was only potentially one dot of available grip that I didn't try to capture. And then, you know, apparently I went at dot and a half maybe. So it wasn't bad. It was just, you know, a little more slip angle than I really wanted at that point. But uh, <laughs> but that's how you learn. Yeah. It's an HPD, you know, push the limits. That's right. That's what, that's what you're there for. That's, that's cool because it's, it's one extra indication that if it inspires you to do something you wouldn't normally try in mm -hmm. a place that's safe to try it, then that's a, that's a huge, that's a huge advantage and a huge help. And it shortcuts the process of, of having to go back after the session and figure that out and go, oh, I wish I had tried to carry a little more speed there. Yeah, it was, um, it was, I'm almost starting to get to the point where I can quantify internally what a dot means at certain points, like how much that means. So I was able to not only know that it was there and quantify it, but I think I'm starting to get to the point where I know when I'm just a little over or just a little under one dot. And yeah. uh, that was helping me a, a ton. That's awesome. Well, on, on the telemetry stuff, we've been, we've been listening to Bill. We're like, I went oh. to the technical team and I was like, Bill needs us to do this guys. Oh, you have no <laughs> idea how much I need, Andrew. There's, there's a long, long list. Of what I need. <laughs> you, know, you know, in my race training part, um, I, I, I knew about the unit, the apex pro. I, I, when I was training, I had so many inputs that I wasn't focused on that because I just wasn't there yet. And then at the end of last year, I, I realized what the Apex Pro was doing. And I have to say that I love the simplicity of it, that there's for a person that is studying with all the, the inputs that you're working on, just to have something that is not doesn't have numbers on it it doesn't have timing on it it doesn't have anything it just has the lines that go across let you know where you're at it, it takes a lot out. i love that part of it and and it just makes it it makes things easy and it lets you focus on things that you might have done after instead of in the process of and That's it lets awesome. me it lets me do the deep dive that she doesn't want to do. Yeah, so. you do the deep dive after, or your crew can do the deep dive after. But for the person that's in the car, they're focusing other things. For me, uh, uh, for my aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. I think I think there's a lot of a lot of truth in that. I think a lot of what we're asking or what our message is to people is that, um, you know, first of all, data doesn't have to be complicated. Mm -mm. Um, us actually driving and what we feel is data. A, particular, we just have to use it the right way. Um, and it's, to, for me, it's kind of a mindset. It's kind of saying that if I learn how to use all the grip that's available, that's going to produce a good lap mm -hmm. time. It's going to produce a fast lap time. Mm -hmm. And that means my technique has to be fundamentally sound and I have to drive the tire the way that it needs to be driven. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to get us very close. You know, we kind of talked about um, I, at NCM, I was driving 98%. Like that's kind of what I felt like in those last 2% are where there's more risk involved. There's more kind of cowabunga living on the edge that right. you have to make happen as a race car driver. When you're qualifying, you got to live on the edge, mm -hmm. but until, until you get to that, that threshold, 
most of us in the in the track day and HPD system, what we aspire to do, we need really strong fundamentals to go fast consistently. And that's that's kind of the message of the product is kind of saying like, figure out how to optimize what the tire wants, figure out how to drive it at its limit, figure out how to keep the the green lights lit through the corners. And that's going to be a, that's going to push you well on your way towards better lap times. Right. Yep. So Andrew, can you talk a little bit about the OBD, OBD to sensor add on? Um, like how does it work and what does Perfect. it add? Yeah, so it's uh, it's still going to be compatible with the Apex Pro Gen 2 device. That won't change. Um, and the OBD2 device plugs into the car's uh, onboard diagnostics port, OBD, uh, and will pull information from the vehicle. And the, the reason that this, this product works is because all manufacturers in the whole world have to allow information to be accessible from the OBD2 port. Uh, and so we're going to produce that information. So you're going to see things like throttle position, um, your engine coolant temperature, um, some other uh, vehicle related um, things like map, uh, like <laughs> mag, uh, manifold air pressure, sorry, um, some other things like that. Um, but most of what we can do with that information after the fact from a driving standpoint is utilize throttle position. And that allows us to have access to a, a gearing calculator so we can help answer the question, you know, do I need to be in third or fourth gear? is a right. pretty popular one but it works just like the apex pro does you plug it into your obd2 port you connect to it via bluetooth with your phone and it's a second bluetooth connection so your phone's connected to the apex pro and the obd2 mm. uh, and they both log data to your phone so if if i were a um a greedy uh techno guy would i be potentially in gen 2 of crew view detail would that be in there yeah. So in crew, do, you, do you want me to go through like what the telemetry feature kind of looks like? Yeah. The new one. I'm dying. Yeah. You're killing it's me. cool. I'm trying to break I, news here. I'll yeah. hold this podcast until you tell me I can put it out, Andrew. Just tell me, give me the stuff. I can send you some screenshots if you want Ooh, to see it. Screenshots. Uh, so we've built, we'll start at the beginning. We've kind of um, fundamentally changed how our, uh, our backend works for crew view. So instead of relying on, uh, iCloud and Apple servers to do data management and um, store all the data. We've transferred that over to something we can leverage more. So we can just keep your data more safe. We can, you know, actually use it for things. We can know more about what people are doing and how, you know, when they're submitting data, all that kind of stuff. So that some of these features are not possible. Um, so that was a big step in the right direction before we did the telemetry streaming feature. So if you're hearing the word telemetry, telemetry is live data. That's, that's kind of what it means. So some people use the word telemetry and data interchangeably and data is the information and telemetry is the method of it being streamed in real time. Um, so telemetry is, is being able to view it. Um, so there is a, there is a slight difference there. So now what you'll see on crew view, if you're um, a lap timer plus subscriber, which is our in-app purchase of which there's going to be some different levels now, um, some less expensive levels, and the current, the current like membership level that we have now, which is a hundred dollars a year, you'll be able to actually see like a live speed trace of the car driving around the track that it generates oh, nice. in like less than a second delay in most cases. Um, and then you can also see uh, longitudinal acceleration and lateral acceleration from the car. Wow. Okay. That's what we have working pretty flawlessly at the moment. Um, we will evaluate adding things to that, like sector times, um, obviously you, are, you already have lap times and a lap time readout, but we could add sector times. We could add any other information that's coming from the device itself. We could add potentially OBD2 information. Uh, and then as we go further and further down that rabbit hole, we could explore endurance racing specific stuff, um, being able to send messages back to the car. Uh, if you have a phone displayed, things like that. Um, but for now, what you'll see if you're using telemetry is a live speed trace and live acceleration data coming off the car. And it actually overlays itself on the old laps. So okay. you can see it kind of each lap kind of falls into the background and the new lap goes on top of it. Okay. Um, and I've is been there using like a it best um, level or like, can you see like historical best or? Uh, currently, it's just each lap gets folded into the background. Okay. You can't okay. go back and look at a, like if you had your best lap on your third lap and you're now on your fifth. Yeah, okay. That's just going to be one in the background. Okay. But that possibility is absolutely there now. 
Um, and it's, I've been using this with my coaching clients and it's mm -hmm. absolutely next level because, um, interpreting a speed trace is pretty, is pretty, uh, fundamental to the data world. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's pretty simple. So we're trying to teach people that and how to do that as much as possible. But now what it does is I can stand track side with a radio and I was, I was at road Atlanta they have a big, big back straightaway there. Right. Yes, they do. And my client's in a fast car, right? A oh. really fast car. And I know he's going to be lifting out of the throttle before that brake zone on the back straightaway. Mm -hmm. But I can see it in the data. Now his speed trace, instead of going up, you know, real steep and then going down, I can see it start to curl over. So on the next lap, I see him coming out of turn seven, going down the back straightaway. And I'm, I'm like, hey, Mike, stay on the gas, right? Stay on the gas oh. into the brake zone. And I yeah. see the speed trace go up, right? Yep. And then he comes by on the front straight away and I give him positive reinforcement. That was great. Perfect. Let's do it again. And then I remind him each lap, but I can, I get real time verification of whether or not he's doing that. Yeah. And it's really simple, but it makes a huge difference. And we don't have to wait until the session's over to go figure out that he was doing that implement it next time. Right. It's done. I think he could have used that at uh, mid Ohio on the back straight. <clears throat> <laughs> So um, what is the initial <laughs> top two or three data types that we should look at for your pro? So when you're viewing your data, what, yeah. what like data channels do you want and to look at? Kind of like a data analysis 101 while we have you for a few more minutes. Yeah, sure. Actually, I have a whole webinar that's focused on this like Ooh. five minute data review idea. Um, oh, excellent. And it's, I watched it's, it. It's awesome. Bill was there. Um, it's very powerful and there's a lot of different, it, just like anything like you would expect with data. It's like, Oh my goodness, there's all this stuff I can look at. Um, so the real answer to the question is it depends, but if you're starting from scratch and is you Ross just Bentley on the podcast, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> I've enjoyed you interviewing Ross on his podcast a lot, Bill. Um, it, it depends. Thanks for I doing that. Thanks, Ross. <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends. It does. Um, but he's, it does. He's right. There's a lot of truth in that statement. Absolutely. Uh, so with Apex Pro, there's some really fundamental features to the product that I, that I would recommend doing. And the first thing that you can do is open the app and look at a GPS image, overhead image of the track. And if you go replay, if you press the little play button on the right side of the screen and just replays the replay the car's position, mm -hmm. watch your best lap or two and just watch, look for minimum corner speeds, look for maximum straightaway speeds, look to see if there's a bunch of red lights on the Apex Pro display in the middle of any corner. And that's going to be the most visually interesting and probably simplest thing to look at for most people like right away. And then the, the next thing that I would do is look at the speed trace, which is the speed versus distance trace and see if you have peaks on the top, what we call the sawtooth at the top, or if it's round at the top. And the reason you want to see that is because a round top means you're coming out of the throttle before you go to brakes. And that's something you want to identify right away. Um, and then the last thing that I like to look, point people to is the friction circle, which I know Bill's very familiar with. Um, and it's, it's, can get kind of complicated if you think about it the wrong way, but it's basically just plotting your longitudinal and lateral acceleration. So lateral is side to side cornering acceleration, longitudinal is braking and acceleration. And basically if that shape of the friction circle is kind of small and concentrated in the center, you're not using all of the, all of the tires grip. You're really underdriving the, the car. It's kind of more of a macro measure. So GPS satellite image, speed trace, friction circle. Um, if you know what those three, three things are, that's a good starting point. And you can jump into the Apex Pro app for free and kind of play around with it and see what I'm talking about. It is quite fun. So I've got a question because we've got a few more minutes of your time and you've been so nice to come on. I was using the Apex Pro for the first time because we, we initially got ours at the beginning of last season, which I don't know if you remember last season. There wasn't much racing to be done. But this was our first race. And um, whether or not you uh, want to lay claim to it or whether or not you deserve any claim to it we're still going to give you a thank you we won our first race this season our first ever win which we were quite happy about all right <laughs> that's awesome we were, we were using the apex pro because we have uh drivers that we don't want to have lap times in the car so apex pro does not give lap times in the car if you don't if you hide the phone face down life is good but i was trying to use the apex pro on the crew view and I was on the radio. I was kind of being crew chief or pit chief or whatever you want to call it, or spotter slash crew chief. 
what I was doing was I was I took a few of what I considered the critical uh, points on a track and looked at what their high speed reached was going into a turn or what their minimum speed going through a turn that I viewed as critical on the track. And I tried to coach them over the radio. Now, given our team, obviously, we can't have that be very simple. And sometimes the radio didn't work, but I was talking to nobody. But that's what I was trying to do was either give them a report on, hey, push the gas a little bit more, you can carry a little further or try to carry a little more speed in or try to get your minimum speed up. There's a lot more to be had there. Is that kind of a good way to use it from an external to the car communicating back to the driver because the driver just has to display and, and you know there's other things to do when there's 100 cars on a track but that could possibly be the longest question i've ever asked but i'm, I'm sorry <laughs> no that's a that's a perfect way to use it and that's exactly what i was referencing a minute ago when i'm coaching my driver using the live speed trace um and as as a race car driver you really want to minimize what you have to do in the car um, so if you, if you can use real time indications to help improve, that's great, but that, but you're still in the zone and you're still focused mm -hmm. and sometimes to get elevated to the next level, you need that external kind of, uh, stimulus, you know, bill on the radio coming in, making a suggestion. Yeah. Um, and so I would say that's an excellent way to use it, particularly because Bill, you've probably looked at data from that track and you know what an acceptable minimum corner speed is in that car. You know mm -hmm. what? to expect for a maximum speed on the straightaway. You can use the crew view features as they exist right now without right. the telemetry mm -hmm. to kind of give you some aid and what you're going to provoke, you know, the thought you're going to provoke with the drivers. The, the really important element of that, and um, Ross, like on Speed Secret Weekly, had a great article about radio conversation, uh, but nailing down some, some kind of like radio discussion criteria, like when you talk to them on the track, you want the driver to expect you to talk in the same place each lap to some extent mm -hmm. um, you want to make those messages sort kind of short and crisp and concise and then you also want to make sure that you have a relationship with the driver where they're receptive to the information you're giving them yep. um because i know as a as a driver uh in the past i've had guys on the radio that i just absolutely i almost need that voice on the radio in an endurance race it really helps me um and then i've had the other end of the spectrum where it's not someone who i have a lot of respect for as a driver necessarily Mm -hmm. And I don't want to pay attention to what they, they tell me. And, and if you watch Formula One, you'll hear some of those conversations that you can tell if the driver, the driver knows their race engineer very well. And they right. know sometimes uh, what to expect from them or not to expect from them. They have this dynamic that's really interesting. And so I think that's a very important thing that if you listen to what Ross does as a coach, that dynamic is important. You have to establish that with the driver. Yeah. Um, so that went a little beyond your question, but that's an excellent way to use it in the car. Um, just little reminders, you know, wide open throttle to the braking zone, yep. you know, accelerate to the three board. Yep. Those types of things are really helpful. Yeah. The, the one thing that we, we did that you mentioned was we were trying to communicate on the front straight of pit race because it was the closest to where our position was. So we figured the signal would be best. And I was absolutely silent when Vicky was in the car because uh, Vicky doesn't want to hear from me ever about driving. Vicky's like, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> She's on mute. Otherwise you'd be hearing her agreeing. She's coming. There she is. It's nothing personal. It's just that <laughs> we work together. We live together. We, we work in the garage together and you know, we, we Sometimes don't. it gets contentious. So if I can have another voice telling me what to do, <laughs> that would be Besides fine. Mine. Besides mine. Besides yeah. mine. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, I was, I, I was actually going to say that too, Bill. Is oh, it, sure. that it's, it's nothing personal, but um, you know, I, as, for some reason, I just can't have my, my husband coach me. I, it just, I just can't, I try, but I can't. Yeah. Oh, my so, wife, my wife will throw me out of the car if I say anything while she's driving on the street. <laughs> if I say, turn your head or, you know, something like that. I'm like, oh, there's an apex over there. We missed it by a mile. Like, Eyes up. Yeah. yeah. yeah she, it's nothing she'll, personal. She'll drop me out. She'll say, okay, you're, you're taking the bus. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Yeah. No, I love, I love the apex, bro. I, I think it's, a, it's definitely, you know, pretty awesome. Um, any tips for using the Apex Pro after driving? Lots. 
Um, I yeah. could I could fall into a yeah, rabbit we, hole. We don't have time for all of them. So right. Are, but, are you able yes. to throw it up on a uh, like a computer? Does, is it? Com- yeah, we you don't pull it up. We, yeah, you you can pull it up on your computer. We don't have a like an application for a computer, mm-hmm. but you can either uh, use. Actually, this is really popular. I see a lot a lot of drivers that have like an HDMI cable. Yeah, mm-hmm. that has a lightning adapter for their phone, and they can display it on a TV or a computer. Okay, just to get a bigger display mm-hmm. and still manipulate it um, with you know your fingers on the on the iPad or the phone. Um, and then there's also some third party. Uh, products like track attack uh, where you can actually look at it in a slightly different format but um, that's a growth area for us for sure because i selfishly would love to have a i'd love to click the apex pro icon on my desktop and have it you know pop right and and so that that's definitely an area i think and i think to be a a long-term participant and player in this marketplace that's something that we'll have to we'll have to do so absolutely Mm -hmm. but the main tips would would be just to take time to learn uh, learn the software. It's, it doesn't take a lot of time, but yeah. invest some in learning how to navigate the app because it's, it's not just, you know, it's not, we're not playing angry birds here. We're, we're learning how to go faster on the racetrack, right? right. It's, it's, it's really fun if you think about it the right way. Um, and there's some really simple things that you can learn that can help you a lot if you're just willing to, to take the time to learn. And I think that's, I think that's very important. Um, learning is usually what's fun about being mm-hmm. at the track. Um, so yeah, more of an attitude thing than a, than a helpful tip. Just mm-hmm. be open to feedback and, and what the data is going to show you. Cause it's not always flattering. My foot was all the way down, Andrew. <laughs> I see that it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but yeah. So how, um, how should you use the apex pro as a driver on the track? just in case somebody's not familiar, you know? Yeah. So the, the apex pros display is, is on LEDs and you have red and green LEDs, red LEDs indicate opportunity uh, to be closer to the edge of the tires capability. Um, So the first thing that you have to do is place the device in a, in a area where you can kind of see it peripherally to some extent. So usually the lower third of your peripheral vision is going to capture the most be able to, to receive the most information. So somewhere on the, I always put mine right in front of me on the dash, kind of closer to the windshield. Um, and then I do, I do what I call it. I don't really necessarily have a name for it, but I identified like two or three places on the track that I'm either struggling or that I know that I'm not at the limit and I might subjectively feel that way. And those are the places where I want to see what it's showing me. Uh, and then I basically just have, and the racers have been doing this since racing started. Um, and it's, it's been called indexing for years. So if mm-hmm. a lot of people use the tachometer to index their corner exit speed. And at a right. certain point at the track out point, they look at the, the tachometer to see how many RPM they're turning. And Apex Pro is the same way. If it's a corner where I'm not rolling enough minimum speed, maybe a long radius corner, I'm turning into the corner, letting the car load up. And then I'm trying to get, is there a red light or not is all I'm trying to understand. Mm-hmm. Am I pushing the tire to its limit or not? Um, maybe there's a braking zone that I know I'm braking too early in. If I know I'm braking too early, I feel I might be braking too early. If I see red lights on the apex pro near the end of the braking zone, that means I'm probably having to prematurely soften the brake pedal so that I'm not over slowing. We all do that, right? Like we break way too early and we're like, Oh, I broke too early. So I'm coming out of the pedal. If you see red lights on the display halfway through the braking zone, then you're like, Oh yeah. Okay. That was too early. Yep. Um, those are just two ways that, that I would, that I would recommend. There's, there's a lot of different ways built kind of touched on it as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like I said, um, without sucking up too much mid Ohio in the rain, I used it. Uh, I was out there. It was one of those classic mid Ohio just got fully wet. It was, uh, a bit of a show and I've got some great video that we'll be posting as soon as I can catch up from my post race hangover uh the apex pro in several in three instances that i can think of right now said that i was at the limit of grit and there were some cars in the proximity of me you two of them were in front one was behind and they decided they were going to go faster and then they dorothy hamill pirouetted right off the track so oh wow i have confirmation data that when it says I am at the grip and you go past that, you will also go wee 
you know, off to the side. So um, one step wow. away from Mario Kart there a little bit. Fun. I just needed my uh, He's like shells. fun. <laughs> uh, that's exciting. So I'll, I'll send you a couple of exciting clips from, from my weekend as well. So we'll, uh, we can great. exchange some, some videos, but I'm suffering the post-race hangover as well. Cause I, yes. uh, yeah, we did two, two straight weekends. So we're trying to, we're trying to get back into line, but uh, it'll get you naps would be a wonderful thing. But anyway, <laughs> Andrew, awesome. new stuff coming out soon. Soon, middle of May. Middle we of are May. looking at a May fifteenth uh, public release date for Apex Pro Gen Two. Excellent. For those of our listeners who want to follow along and maybe get some uh, sneak peeks, perhaps, what where should they uh, look to get some information? Website, uh, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Yeah, uh, the first place you'll see information on Gen Two is our Lap Timer Plus subscribers Facebook group. Okay. Uh, because those are the folks who are um, uh, have our annual membership and are a part of our uh, in-app in-app uh, purchase. So that's who's going to hear about it first. We're going to host a webinar. Mm-hmm. Then we'll probably um, share that information with um, share information on Gen Two publicly with our newsletter. So if you're not on that, you can find uh, sign up for that on our website apextrackcoach.com. And then shortly after, uh, social media official Apex Pro on Instagram. Apex Pro on Facebook, you'll see announcements about um, Apex Gen 2. Um, there will be uh, some exchange uh, programs for your Gen 1 unit if you're a Laptimer Plus subscriber. Um, so we will uh, we will actually take those in on exchange, and there will be kind of an upgrade program. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun. I think a lot of people are going to want to do that. Uh, yep. But most people I've talked to already are like, well, I'm keeping the old one too. So, you know, you're not getting your hands back on this. But um, – about middle of May, May 15th. Uh, they right. should be in dealers' hands and, and in the public. So I've got bad news for our listeners, though. What's that? They can't have the first orders because ours have been in for about a month now. Oh, okay. Sorry. We we're almost sold out of our first production run as well. So if if this um, if the uh, the airwaves, uh, I don't know when, when this will be released, I guess. But Your call. Um, Hey, well, I, May fifteenth might be might be <laughs> May 15th. somewhere around there. Happy May fifteenth, um, everybody. That's right. <laughs> there might not be any any left uh, for our first production run because, of course, COVID has made uh, getting certain electronic components very difficult. So Absolutely, there's some stuff that's been hard to find. But I really appreciate you guys having me back on. This was fun the first time, and it's uh, been exciting. Sounds great. Thank you for coming on, sir. Thank you. Dominating with Dawson. All right, who's whose was that? Vic, uh, Jen did contact patch, right? Vicky, you got one. I'm looking. All right, you take too long. You said you had a couple. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, yeah, maybe not now. I don't know. Yeah, I, I got one. Ben Dawson. Aaron's ben doing. Dawson, come in. Ben Dawson. President. 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 I've got a six-letter question for you. All right. V I R W T F. Why do you talk about it all the time? Yeah, tell me about VIR. What's, <laughs> what, is v, yeah, what is VIR's greatness? Because you're not the only one that keeps talking about VIR. Well, let me only speak to my own experience and say, I have been living an hour from this place since 2002. I started okay. going there in 2005. It is now 2021. That's where I've done the bulk of my driving, testing, and racing like i've done almost all of my driving at vir luckily i've been able to do a lot of other stuff other places but it's just home base so for my own self i can say that's why i talk about it but also i have to say i've driven a lot of courses and i don't think any of them hold the nuance that vir does there's so many little weird magical spots for the track you're like oh i don't think this is going to work but this is how you have to do it um so much counterintuitive stuff there's so much elevation there's a whole s's section an uphill s's that pretty much every car can run flat out once you get into kind of mid-level kind of NASA thunder level race cars, those guys might have to breathe it a little bit near the top. But I mean, you can even watch an IMSA race. You watch those guys go balling up through those S's. It looks pretty fun, right? Have you ever watched cars race around VIR? It's a pretty fun looking track, right? You know who's on the podcast with you right now, don't you? <laughs> yeah. So that would be so that. 
<laughs> oh, oh, really? I thought you were going to say, yeah, I've seen it a little bit. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fun track to barrel around. It's got, it's got some good rhythm sections. It's got some real, real big challenges and it's an hour for me. So I'm going to definitely be biased just from, <laughs> I got a location bias if anything else, but um, you know, I, I've also, I mean, I've driven uh, Laguna Seca. I've driven Sears Point. I've driven Thunder Hill a lot of places out West, a lot of places on the East coast and, you know, Watkins Glen, Rhode Atlanta, Barber, a lot of places people call it landmark tracks and they don't, they don't even shine. They don't even shine an iPhone flashlight to the bright sun that is VIR in my mind. So is it um, like some of the turns there or is it the overall layout? Is it the. There will, one of the things that's great about it is there are several layouts that you can go enjoy. You can run the full course. Um, there, there's a, a North course and a South course configuration they can do they can bisect the track if they got you know bikes running the south course and getting cars running the north course so so that that's a lot of fun too the two the two different the the, the courses where they break it up are a lot of fun the connectors are, are fun and different and different just a different way to run half the course uh, there's also a grand course which kind of takes you through it runs most of the north course and the south course and their connectors and the, the, so that, that ends up being kind of wild and fun so that's that's another thing about it too is it, it's got just Great barbecue. Also, did I say that yet? Barbecue is sandwich. Not yet. Oh, I would drive to VIR just for a barbecue sandwich. Um, and the facilities are good. You've been to some tracks, I'm sure, where it's more like it's like a track and this many porta potties. Yeah. And VIR has nice bathrooms. I've, you know, I've been there for for endurance races and taking showers. And stuff. I like I live an hour from there. I've taken a shower there before I've gone home before. <laughs> I've been so gross. So you know, it's it's a place. I, I've been going there so long. It feels like home. But also. Uh, you know, you got two big long straightaways. You got the, uh, the the oak tree set of corners. That's a whole different. You know, two tight corners that are a real big challenge. Uh, the roller coaster, like, look, there's a turn called roller coaster. Why have y'all been there yet? There's a turn called roller coaster. <laughs> um, also, South Course has a turn called Bitch, which it really is. It's the toughest corner <laughs> any of y'all have like ever seen. Like madness. Uh, no, it's worse. It's called Bitch. Uh, it's really <laughs> tough. <laughs> it says bitch on the map of the track so you know i mean it's a I, at least in my opinion and I, as i've revealed several times as you once you ask this question vir and wtf uh is, is i have a location bias and it's really close to me and familiarity breeds love in this case um but yeah y'all just have to come see it. just come and see and find out sooner than later um We'll find we'll find a good track of it if, if no if no races coming up fit fit your fit your body shop budget or your what you want to be doing <laughs> road trip yeah but yeah you just have to come see I I I came out of karting uh, to the world of road course so I was I was racing karts in North Carolina and then I uh, I sold all that crap bought a Miata it was just a dead stock street Miata I put a, a hard dog roll bar and racing seats and belts in it and I just went to the track. And it was so much fun in that Miata. And, and I just, you know, my whole career kind of in cars built itself around VIR. And so, it's, you know, everything's kind of home base and will always be my, my favorite kind of home track. Ladies. Let's go. Come on down. Go to VIR. I've been hearing a lot about VIR. And there's also, I don't know if this, if this is uh, going to reach any friendly ears. But there's also a lot of stuff you can do around there that's not driving race cars. They got a cool uh, go kart thing where you can go drive these. Not exactly like uh, what do they call them? Consumer cars. Not the kind you can go drive in your local indoor building around a, a bunch of tires. Like these are tuned up a little bit faster than that. And it's a real outdoor course. It's a lot of fun. A lot of off camber stuff. Depending on which direction they're running the course, you can do enduro events. Like if NASA's running there, they'll also have like a car endurance like a, you know, hour and a half enduro race if, for teams that want to go sign up for that at the car track. So, you know, usually there's a lot of stuff going on there. There's also like a defensive driving course there. They'll have a bunch of old crown Vicks that they can beat the crap out of each other with to learn how to like drive in terrorist situations or something. There's like a defense contractor on there. And there's, you know, like, I think you can go shoot skate. There's also spas. So there's a bunch of crap to do. It's, it's really like a motorsports resort more than, uh, you know, as much as anything else. Sorry, not more than anything else. But as much as anything else, there's a lot of activities you can do. You can buy a membership. You can own a villa on the site. Like it's, uh, I, I think they make good money. But <laughs> also, it's just a great track. Ladies. I want to go. Yeah, come on down. Sounds like we need to go while school's out. Yeah. We just added another race. Or HPD, <laughs> who knows? Here we go. We'll do something. Yeah, I, I, I gotta say, it's just, it's just, I've driven a lot of great, great courses that I'd be happy to drive again. But I'm glad VR is the one I can go to every time I needed to go test a car or just be close to a track. I'm very lucky. 
Yeah, our close one is Pocono. Uh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'd never raced in yeah. Pocono. Yeah, knock yourself out or just come on down to VAR. There's a, there's, a re- there's a reason why you haven't raced at Pocono. I have. Uh, <laughs> we'll, put the, we'll put the video in the show notes. You know which one I'm talking about, Bill. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> I know that guy. I, I see that guy. His name is David Melhado. He's a cool dude. Super cool Mustang guy. He's the guy that's like that. He's 70 Mach 1 on YouTube. <laughs> when I met him, I was like, oh, my God, you're the guy who took that video. <laughs> <laughs> it will be on the show notes. Yeah, buddy. Ah. <laughs> Very well. Cool. All right, VAR, it's on the list. Come to VAR. Come see us. That's right. We got to find an HBD because I don't think there's any races to fit. Yeah, cool deal. All right, very well. VAR, it's on the list, ladies. See Sounds you down good. here. Very well. <laughs> awesome. Right. Bye, Den. Bye, Ben. <laughs> Bye, who's, Den. Who's Den? Yeah, I know. I'm getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> Late night. All right. <laughs>